G'day, I'm Dr Mike. When I'm not hanging out with Jake and Olivia at All About Animals, I'm working at Vet Products Direct. It's an online shop with thousands of discounted pet care products, and you can talk to vets and vet nurses who care about your pet as much as you do. Use promotion code ANIMALS to receive 5% off your order, plus free postage anywhere in Australia. I'll see you at vetproductsdirect.com.au, and enjoy the show. This program is proudly brought to you by Vet Products Direct, Holistic Select and the Walmart Company. Hi, welcome back to All About Animals. I'm Olivia. And I'm Jake. On today's show, I go whale watching off the coast of South Australia and we go to the Million Paws Walk. After that, I meet a very cool international dancer, Kobe. Oh, and don't forget to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages for cool updates. We've got an action-packed show, so make sure you sit back and enjoy watching. Did you know that blue whales can weigh up to 200 tonnes? That's the same as 40 elephants. And their tongues can weigh as much as a single elephant. 340,000 blue whales were killed in the last century. Today, a few thousand in the southern hemisphere face a new threat. The expansion of the offshore oil and gas industry. I4 is determined to secure critical blue whale habitat from harmful industry. I decided to chat to Dr. Mike Bosley to find out how we can help these amazing creatures. Hi, Dr. Mark. G'day, Jake. Now, over the years, I've learned a few things about blue whales. They're really amazing facts. I wanted to know if they're true or not. The heart of a blue whale is the same size as like a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, I reckon that's pretty true. They are huge animals. And that the veins are big enough to swim through? Well, I think a small bloke could swim through them. Yeah, I doubt that I could fit through them. <laughs> and what about, like, how much krill they eat a day? Because I heard they eat a lot of krill. Yeah, they do eat a huge amount of krill. Well, they're such big animals. Is that their main diet? Do they just eat krill? Yeah, that's that's not their main diet. That is their only diet. Yeah, they, they just oh. eat on krill, which are these small, tiny, small shrimp-like animals. In the last century, there's been about 340,000 blue whales have been killed. How many are left? It's really hard to, to count the number of blue whales because they're all over the oceans. Yeah. But it's probably um, less than 10,000 for sure, and possibly Wow. So does that make them endangered or critically endangered? Or? But they are endangered. Um, one of the reasons they're endangered is because they spread out all over the ocean. Really hard for the males to find the females to mate. Yeah. And one of the problems is that they use these very low frequency sounds. It's a big it's a booming sound but very low. And with all of the increase in ships in the ocean making a lot of noise, it's becoming increasingly difficult for them to find each other. So that's making their recovery from, from being just about wiped out really difficult. Being hit by boats is, is another issue for them, being tangled up in nets and, and fishing gear and so forth. Yeah. Those are the main things. Now, they're, they're not meant to be hunted anymore, so that's not really an issue anymore. So what kind of whales do we have around Australia? Oh, we've got a lot of whales around Australia. Yeah. Um, we do have, uh, have blue whales. We have, uh, uh, they're a special kind of blue whale called a pygmy blue whale. Okay. It's a bit, a bit smaller than the big ones. Uh, we have humpback whales and we have southern right whales. Uh, they're the main ones we have, we have around here, but there are others as well. So what things can we do to help protect the whales? Well, probably the main threat to whales in Australian waters is through damage to their habitat. And in particular, we're very concerned about all of the drilling for oil that's going on around our waters. And if one of those goes wrong, like it did in the Gulf of Mexico a few years ago, and that could destroy not just what whales, but you know, it would be catastrophic for all wildlife. Yeah, heaps of marine life. Yeah, lots of uh, conservation organisations like I4 and Greenpeace and WDCS and so forth are continually pressuring the government to try and ensure that, that these sorts of things don't happen. So it'd be really good for people to support organisations like that. So how close can we get to whales in the wild? If you're on the water, in a, in a boat, then the approach distance varies from state to state actually, but in South Australia, here, where we are now, it's 100 metres. 100 That's metres. quite a long way. You can see whales from land in some fantastic places. There's a place up at the head of the Great Australian Bight. Just look down from cliffs onto whales. You don't 
trouble them at all, but if you get too close in boats, you can really you know, hassle them quite badly, and they've got calves with them, and become very stressful for them, and uh, yeah, just not a good thing to do. Well, that's great information, Dr. Mike. Thanks for your time. You're very welcome. Keep out the good work, Jack. Will do. <laughs> Please help us spread the word to help save the whales. You can make a difference. So go to i4.org to help the whales today. be insured, like big ones like horses? Yes, Olivia. Affinity have been insuring horses for nearly 10 years. Wow. People's pets. So there's some horses that are valued up to a million dollars. So what kind of things would you insure a horse for? You'd insure a horse for if it got lost or stolen. Yep. You could insure it if it died or it got hurt or injured. Yep. You could even insure your saddle and your bridle. What are some of the most common injuries that horses can get? Well, horses can get cut or they could fracture their bones. Yep. Some horses get sick too and get colic. And does it cost a lot to get them treated? A trip to the vet, Olivia, can always cost a lot of money. Yep. Uh, colic surgery could cost over $5,000. Oh, wow. And if you have to get your horse bandaged up for bleeding, could be a visit out there. So it's a lot of money. That's yeah. why insurance is so important. So what kind of things would insurance not cover? Well, insurance is designed, Olivia, to cover things that are emergencies. So, yep. like, it doesn't cover your normal visit from the vet or, yep. say, the farrier or a dentist. Right. But what it does cover is if you, your horse gets injured and needs needs to get emergency surgery yep. um, and all those expensive things. All right. And, Paul, do you cover horses that do high-risk events like cross-country? Yes, Olivia, we, we insure a whole lot of uh, horse activities. Cross-country, show jumping, we insure uh, raining, cutting, yep. um, trail riding, all, right. all sorts of events. Oh, cool. So how would I get kite insured? It's really simple, Olivia. You can get onto our website yep. or you can just phone our office and there's a form to fill out and it's quick as and easy as that. And what kind of information would I need to give Affinity? We'd need to know your horse's name. Yep. His breeding, yep. uh, what activities he takes care of, like what activities involved in. Yep. Um, we'd also want to know that he's fit and healthy. He looks pretty fit and healthy to me. Yeah, well, knowing that he's completely protected and paying a little bit each month, it's definitely worth it. I'll get straight onto it. That's a great idea, Olivia. Let's go. Sure. Come on, Kite, what do you think? Hi, Lada. Hi, Diane. Hi, JK. Hi, Jay. This is a great idea. Well, why would you need a first aid kit for your pet? Well, really no different to why you need a first aid kit for your workplace, for your home or for your vehicle. It's because accidents can happen any time and you want to be prepared if there's an accident and um, this is a good way to look after your furry family members. <laughs> and if I have the kit, does that mean I don't have to take my pet to the vet? No, not at all. It's not designed to take over vets. What it is, it's designed as post and pre-vet care. So it's to help look after your pet until you get it to the vet and then after they've been to the vet to um, you know, assist with some of the bandages and etc that the vet might suggest that you need. But do I need to do a special course to be able to use the kit? No. No, you don't, but I would recommend that you do a St John course because you can apply the same sort of techniques that they teach you there to your pet. So what sort of injuries does it cover? Well, it's, it's a good kit because it covers all your major injuries, which is your big bleeds in case they, you know, they get hit by a car, etc. But it also covers just the smaller things in there as well. So just for wound cleaning, etc. And so it is designed that to get you to the vet if it needs further assistance. So what kind of things are in the kit? We've got a variety of different bandages. You've got some bigger bleeds dressing, so if there is a bigger bleed, um, you've got a syringe for feeding. And is it the same as a human first aid kit? It's very similar, but the most important difference is that it includes a vet wrap bandage, which is specially designed to go over animals' injuries. It does not stick to the fur, it does not stick to the wound, the bandage sticks to itself. So where can I get a pet first aid kit and how much would it cost? Okay, so you can easily get it from our St John website, which is um, stjohnsa.com.au and they're just $37. Oh, okay, that's great. So, can you give me a demonstration? Yeah, not a problem. Sure. So, who have we got here today, Jake? Oh, uh, we've got really cute little Sybil. <laughs> Hi, Sybil. What I'm going to do today is one of the most common injuries a dog can get in, in the backyard is cutting its paw. It might jump up on a fence or cut it on a piece of glass. Okay. So, Sybil, thank you. I'm going to fix you up. So what we need, and we just apply our first aid skills um, that St John teach us, we're going to put a little compression bandage on okay. and then we're going to put some vet wrap on. So what we do is we just fold the bandage, we want to put a little bit of pressure on the bottom of the paw 
And you can already see she's not liking that. No. And she's going to not like it less. So it is very important to be quick but thorough as well. And remember, if it's bleeding a lot, don't be scared to make the bandage firm because you're going to take this dog to the vet straight away. So how am I going to keep that on? I can go up and okay. I can go over and I can use that as a support to keep the bandage on. Okay. And there we're done. We don't need any tape or anything because this bandage sticks to itself. Okay. And then you've got a paw that's not bleeding anymore and you can take it to the vet to get it checked. To get your pet first aid kit, go to stjohnsa.com.au. So Dr Mark, why don't we talk about healthy coats today? I'd love to do that and I tell you what, Honey has got one beautiful coat here, she don't you? She does, certainly does, yes. yeah. So why do dogs scratch all the time? It's probably the question that as a vet I get asked the most. Why does my dog scratch? And there are so many reasons why. It's oftentimes a very difficult question to answer. There's so many different reasons, often hard to diagnose and really, really difficult to treat. So what's causing the problem? Probably the most typical reason that they're going to be scratching is to do with external parasites, fleas and ticks. And when you see how much they bite and irritate, it's, it's not surprising that dogs get pretty upset about it. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Second area is anything to do with allergies, like contact allergies. So they can be allergic to grass, to plants, even sometimes to the bedding that they're sleeping on or the coats that we put on them. Yeah. The third thing that they are allergic to is food. And so oftentimes what we're feeding them in their diet is actually making them very itchy and irritated. Yeah. So that could be, yeah, they, they could be allergic to um, beef or wheat in their diet. Okay, how can we make them feel more comfortable? Yeah, I think this, this is a problem where you really need a specialist. You need some specialist advice. Go and talk to your vet and develop a plan. So they're going to probably do all sorts of different tests. They're going to ask you for a lot of history about your pet to find out what's, you know, what's at the root of the problem. They might do some skin allergy testing. Okay. But what they'll do is they'll work with you and they'll put together a plan that'll get on top of the problem. So what diet can help a dog that's scratching a lot? Diet is a really, really critical part of the whole problem. You might find that your vet uh, recommends a skin health diet, even something from the well pet range. One of the advantages of a product like this is the ingredients. It's got a single protein source, so in this case it's made up of fish meal, including things <laughs> like anchovies and sardines, so they're going to love oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. The carbohydrate is made up of oatmeal, and that's well recognised to just have really soothing qualities for skin and coat. It's also very high in essential fatty acids, omega-3s and 6s, and what they do is they're like a natural anti-inflammatory and making great skin and coat. Interestingly, it's not only what's in it, it's what's not in it. So there's no artificial colourings, no flavourings, no preservatives, no sweeteners, very little salt. It's just a great, well-balanced diet. Wow. Wow, that's really good. That'd be really healthy. <laughs> Now those of you who saw our last show know just how out of control my dog is. So we made a call to George from Sid Jobs Day to try and get some help. Oh, that's fantastic. Hi George, thanks for coming. Pleased to meet you Jake. Here to help you with your dogs. Yeah, they're just out the back. Let's have a look. So Jake, I've had a look at some footage from last week. Yep. And uh, some of the problems they're displaying. Uh, so what I'd love to work with you and um, sort out some of those problems, calm them down as dogs. They're, they're a bit too hyperactive yeah uh, and uh, they're obviously not respecting you they're pulling you around and jumping all over you yeah so I want to work with that and get them uh, to respect you a bit more and calm them down as dogs all so right. uh, what I'll do is I'll go out and introduce myself yeah and uh, see how they react to that and then we'll come back in and have a chat all right that sounds good so back the big one's called candy and the little one's called socks wow I can't believe how easily he's just walked outside without them jumping up all over him he must be some kind of dog whisperer. So, so George, how did that go? That was their first boundary, Jake. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to teach them a few boundaries and rules. They react to who I am. Yeah. And uh, so they chose to become more passive. And because they saw me as someone above them in the pecking order, they didn't jump on me. Okay. So it's very important that you understand your behaviour and how it affects your dogs. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm not sure if the problem's with me or the dogs. I hope I can pick up some helpful hints. So tune into our next show to see how I'm going. 
After learning about the history of wool in our last show, we went to visit Tom Ashby at North Ash Rose in the Clare Valley to get up close and personal with his prized merino rams. So Tom, what type of sheep is this? This is a pole merino, Olivia. What's so unique about the wool? The merino wool is probably the world's best natural fibre. And um, the merino is a really unique animal because it can grow a really nice soft fleece that can be used for spinning into jumpers, suits, um, all sorts of fashion garments. And a matter of fact, wool's made a real big comeback on the um, fashion catwalk. And since Australia is such a big country, what's the best climate for a merino? Well, the merino is actually very adaptable to all types of climate. But we, we breed a different type of merino for the harsher climate. It has a little stronger wool and um, is a bit bigger animal. Does the merino have any health problems? Yeah, the merino does. I mean, um, like all animals, they, they have some health problems. Um, worms is probably one of the big ones, and also lice. They're probably the two bigger health problems. How do you treat those? Well, we use a, a drench gun and, and give them a shot of drench down their throat for, for worms and lice. If you can just see the remnants of a, a little bit of blue in, in the wool there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's from the lice chemical. When he was shorn, we, we put a back liner on there and that absor absorbed through the skin and, uh, and that gives him protection from lice. Okay. Cool. For those that he has a really thick coat, how long did it take for him to grow it? Well, this ram was actually only shorn in March this year. Oh. So he hasn't, he's um, only got three to four months growth on him and it's a really, really good fleece because it's nice and crimpy and uh, very white because <laughs> we like to breed the wool very white because that handles the, the dye of the colours for the jumpers. Yeah. All right. Okay. And because he's got such a lot of wool, how long would it take for someone to shear him? Um, a ram like this would probably take him about five minutes. Okay. Yeah. But if he was shearing a, a ewe just straight out of the paddock, probably about three minutes. Oh, oh okay. Mm. So how often would a sheep like this need to be shorn? Probably every 12 months, once every 12 months. But um, a, a real top ram, sometimes we shear them twice a year just to keep them healthy. And Why do some of them have horns and the others don't? Well, in the 1950s we started breeding the horns off um, the sheep. Mainly due to the horns can get caught in fences, trees, bushes and things like that, but we still have a few horn sheep. Oh, OK. All right. Cool. How, do you, how do you pick the best ram for, for mating? Well, that's interesting. These days we use, um, we body weigh the rams, we eye muscle test them, and you see that little bit of darker um, wool there. That's yep. from the, a bit of vegetable oil we pour on there, and then you put a scanner, like a pregnancy scanner, on the skin, and you can measure how much eye muscle they have. Yeah, OK. We also fleece test the fleece. See, he's got a hole in him there. Now that's... Oh. oh, yeah. So we take a sample of the wool and we send it away to get tested. It's basically fleece, fleece weight, fleece measurement, body weight and eye muscle. Visually, he's got to be good, good straight legs and very correct, just, just like any animal. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's lots of things to look for when you're breeding merinos because they have this beautiful fleece. Yeah. They also have a, a very good um, high protein meat. So they're really a dual purpose animal. Yeah, so there's a lot of criteria to go through. There is, <laughs> yes. Wow, there's so much to learn about these merino rams. We'll catch up with Tom again in another episode and I'll see what it's like to be a working dog. For more information, go to merino.com. <laughs> okay, guys, are you ready to hear this week's animal joke? Totally. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so what do bugs learn in school? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Moth-o-matics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good one! Yeah, yeah. Where are the RSPCA Million Paws Walk in Adelaide? The Million Paws Walk is the biggest fundraiser the RSPCA held, with all the proceeds going to help thousands of animals in their shelter. So, do you know what RSPCA stands for? Um, something, something, something animals? No, Jake, it's the Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Oh, oh, okay. I wonder how many animals are kept there each year. I think a lot. I know, there would be heaps there. Yeah. Well, we had some great weather again this year for the Million Paws Walk, which really does draw a huge crowd. Have been to the Million Paws Walk before? Every year for the last 10 years. Every oh, year? Wow. Dogs up. These are schnauzers. Oh, they're schnauzers. Ah. We brought the dogs out for the day, but we are here for animal welfare as a whole, all of the species. The RSPCA is an animal welfare agency, and we like to see animals to get great homes and have a great life, and that's what we're here about today. There were lots of proud owners showing off their dogs, and some even wore nail polish. Oh. 
Well, as much as the day was about getting out in the sunshine and taking our dogs for a walk, we should always remember that it is about the RSPCA and promoting responsible pet ownership and raising money so they can continue to do their fantastic work. Well, last year we were able to raise just over 120,000 and that was on the five 6,000 attendees, so we're looking good for doing that again this year. There were lots of fun things to do. We decided to get Aussie Pooch to wash our dogs so they were clean and smelling fresh. Helping us uh, judge the awards here. Then we helped judge some fun competitions in the main arena. There were so many to choose from. Oh, it was the perfect day and we love being involved again. Oh, all this walking is making me hungry. I'm going to go get something to eat. Oh, cool, what are you going to get? A hot dog, of course. What? No, you can't. Yeah, I can. I'll have it with mustard. Jake. What? So for your chance to win a year's supply of holistic slate pet food, go to allaboutanimals.tv and enter the competition. Yes, it's that time again, viewers pets. I get lots and lots of great photos of your pets emailed in and I love looking through them all. I've picked out a few to share with you, so let's take a look. First up, we have 13-year-old Amber from Campbelltown, SA and her two dogs, Charlie and Chloe. Charlie is a seven-year-old papillon and is very boisterous. After his bath, he runs around like crazy. Chloe is a three-year-old beagle and she loves to eat food all the time. Once, she even opened the pantry door and ate a whole potato. The next photo was sent in by Madison from Maryborough, Queensland. Madison's pet is a snake called Whizzer. He got his name after going to the toilet on her auntie's arm. He loves to sit around Madison's neck when she goes out shopping. I wonder if people get a fright when they see him in public. And the last one for today is 11 year old Chloe from the Sunshine Coast with her pony and mouth. King is Chloe's pony and he's part Arab, part Welsh Mountain and part Appaloosa. His favourite thing to do is to please Chloe, which she loves. Her other pet is a mouse called Turbo, who races through obstacle courses really fast. Chloe believes that he who has not loved an animal has never lived. I agree, Chloe. So to have your pet on our show, just email info at allaboutanimals.tv with three photos of you and your pet, five things about your pet, and your name, age, suburb, and state. And don't forget to enter our awesome competitions. Go to www.allaboutanimals.tv. Today I'm talking to Kobe, a professional hip-hop dancer and bull mastiff owner. Hi Kobe. Hi Olivia. So how does someone become a professional hip-hop dancer? Well, for starters you've got to have a lot of talent within you and then you have to get trained as well, um, practice a lot. And then when you want to break out into the professional world, you have to go to all these events and at the events you may get seen by another professional dancer and from there you can, they can help you. So I see you brought a friend along. Who's this? Yes, this is Scooby. So Kobe, how old is he? He's about six months old. Okay, and where'd you get him from? We got him from the RSPCA. Okay, and I heard that bull masters can grow to be pretty big. They can, they can be very big dogs and he's going to be a handful. <laughs> yeah. And what are their temperaments like? Um, he's very loyal and he's very caring to family members. Now I've heard that you've been asked to study dance in Sydney. Tell me more about it. Well the dance school that I'm going to be studying at is called the Village Performing Arts Centre or okay. otherwise known as VPAC. Um, I went there just to have a look at it and they asked me if I could join as soon as possible because they have they'd heard about what I've done previously as well. Okay, wow. So yeah, I'm going to do that in a couple of weeks. Okay. So will we have to move into state full time? Yeah, I will. Will you miss your family? Um, I will miss my family, but I've done this like a couple of times before, so. Yeah. And will you miss your dog? I will miss Scooby. I'll miss him very, very much. He is a very cute dog. <laughs> so don't you travel to LA quite a bit? Yes, I do. And what's it like? It's quite nice, LA. Um, it's got a little bit nerve wracking being away for the family for a long time, but. I'm fine with it and I have lots of friends over there as well. So what do you do there? Well I go over there to do dance workshops, I did a music video clip once okay. there and also did this event called Carnival. And my last question is who's your favourite hip hop artist? Asha. Asha all the way. Okay. Well good luck in Sydney Kobe. Thank you. 
Wow, what a great show that was. It certainly was. And don't forget to go to our website to check out the great competitions. And we'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.